If you had to pick your favorite TV family, who would it be? Just yell it out. Who's that? Ozzy and Harriet. All right. Who's that? The Waltons? What'd you say? Burrow, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, Beaver Cleaver and his family, the Cleaver family. What was it? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know that one. What else? No one said the Simpsons. How come nobody, nobody that's not their favorite fan? Uh, oh, Rich said he didn't want to say it. Okay, well, we'll have counseling after service, too, for anybody. That, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> one, of my fam- one of my favorite uh, families growing up was uh, the Cunningham family, if you know them. Uh, you had Richie, Joni, Howard, Marion. Um, happy Days, right? That was I, I was allowed to watch a lot of TV when I was a kid, and I thought that was like a new show when I was a kid, even though I was watching the reruns. But um, it was a hit show in the late 70s and early 80s that took place in the 50s. Throw in the great supporting characters and actors like uh, Potsy and Ralph and Al, Chachi, and many more. It was a very memorable show for many people for a lot of time. But I think more than anything else, the thing that comes out of Happy Days that most people are familiar with is Fonzie, right? Fonzie was like the definition of cool. If you never watched any of you do, just to remind you, uh, he wore the leather jacket like everywhere. It didn't matter how hot or cold it was. He had that leather jacket on. He rode a motorcycle. He was always on a date with somebody. And I, you just loved how the fact that like if something didn't work, he would just hit it and it automatically work. Now, I've tried that with various things and usually it works less after I hit it. But for Fonzie, like, he would just do that. Remember the jukebox or the lights? He would just give it a hit, and uh, it would work. Now, all the, all the teenage guys there, they wanted to be like Fonzie, even with his office in Al's diner's bathroom, which is odd. Um, but they all wanted to be him, and Fonzie was the picture that showed up, I think, for a lot of people when you just thought of, who's cool? It was Fonzie, right? And he probably had a comb in his back pocket, too, I mean, because that was really cool. Now, remember the switchblade combs? That was like, you know, a little above Fonzie, but anyway, I digress. Um, Now, at the height of its popularity for Happy Days, in 1977, there was an episode, or a couple episodes actually, where the gang goes off to Hollywood. They're going to Hollywood, and at one point, to prove how brave he was, Fonzie gets on water skis, and he's still wearing his leather jacket while on water skis, because again, that's how cool he was. And he decides that he's going to um, ski up a ramp and jump a shark that's in the water. Does anybody remember that episode? Yeah, right? Now, this was such an out-of-place event. Like, it, it didn't make any sense with normal, the normal show of Happy Days. And there was a decline in the ratings from every year after that. It's said to have been the beginning of the end when Fonzie jumped the shark. Are you familiar with that saying, jumping the shark? You ever heard that? Someone said, well, they jumped the shark. Did you know that that's where that saying comes from? It's the idea that that's where Fonzie jumped the shark and the show eventually declined. It's, it's not only to, was that kind of the hinge on which Happy Days swung, it birthed the saying to describe an abandoning of what something was. It kind of leaves behind what made it what it is. You know, it's kind of at the core of what it was changed eventually leading from success to decline. So it's kind of a, man, something changed there. It's not quite the same. Now, most of us have had those moments in our life. Maybe we don't always catch the moment at the time, like something happens, and we're not aware of it at the time that something is changing. Maybe we don't understand the impact it'll have from that point forward. But sometimes as you think back on your life, you reflect on different decisions that you have made, you can think of a time when something you were involved with jumped the shark, so to speak. Maybe it was a job, maybe it was a relationship, maybe um, it was a fun activity, it could have been a hundred different things. Everything had been going so well, and then it didn't. Something changed. And you can trace it back to this one decision, say, man, now that I look back at it, everything was going one direction. That one decision changed everything from then on. Now, today we're going to spend time in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and this is a pivotal uh, passage. We're going to be in the first half of this passage. This is a pivotal chapter, but the first half of this passage, it's pivotal in the trajectory of the life of King David. 
Because we see this jumping of the shark taking place in the rule and in the life of David. And what we learn from David's life is that we can control our decisions, but we cannot control the consequences. Let me say that again. We can control our decisions, but we cannot control the consequences. Now, this takes place about a thousand years before Jesus. Um, Israel is God's chosen people, and David was their second king. And under his rule, the nation of Israel had become like a world power on the political stage at that time, at the height of his rule. And at the height of his rule is where we find today's passage. And so, if you want to turn, if you haven't turned there already, to 2 Samuel chapter 11, or you tap your way to 2 Samuel chapter 11, or the words will be on the screen. Um, We're going to go through this, and we're going to step through it, so we're not going to read it as a one. We're going to step through it, but here's how it begins. Chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. Jump down to however David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Bless you. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of his palace. Don't miss this very important beginning to this passage. David is at the height of his power and his authority. He's kind of at a place now where he's established as king. He's gotten to where he had been anointed so many years before. He's kind of, things are good. Like, life is really good for David at this point. And what's interesting is he had a choice there, and he chose power and naps. Not a power nap, but he chose power and naps, while others did the fighting for him. So that's a choice there that he made. That's an important choice he made. Now, if we were to go back to the life of Daniel in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel up to this point, this is not the David that we have come to know. But when kings typically go to war, David stayed in his new palace, comfortable, safe, and peaceful. But David wasn't satisfied. It wasn't enough. Is there ever enough? Is there ever enough money? Is there ever enough feeling comfortable? There's always a little bit more, right? Say, I I feel pretty good, but I can feel a little bit better. Is there ever enough where you feel just safe enough, where you have to stop worrying about it? Is there ever enough rest? Is there ever enough... Is there never enough to be content? I think David's probably not that much different than anyone else. But he continues here in the second verse. It says, As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. I want us to take notice of two things in this passage before we get too far into it. It's the possession and the movement. Bathsheba is scarcely scarcely mentioned by name in this whole account. Instead, she's just named as the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah. Now, of course, we understand that in that culture, women were were considered different than maybe they are now. Um, And and it was at the time where women had very little rights and were often seen as property. But in the telling of the story, we even see that a little bit. But we need to let that probably speak to us about both property and people. Do we care that a person will be treated like property? Do we care that people are still treated like like things or stuff, women or otherwise. Do we ever treat people like stuff? Stuff to help us to get what we want. Things to make us feel the way that we want to feel. Stuff to be used when it's useful and thrown out when it's not. I I don't know how many memes you'll find on the internet that say, if people are no use to you, kind of move on from them. Or there's people that will say that. Hey, you know what? They weren't really fitting into my, my goal for life, so I got rid of them. And I'm not saying to get, oh, there's something about like get stepping out of bad influences or things that are dangerous, but sometimes we treat people as a means to an end, and when we can no longer benefit from them, we're kind of done with them. One place that happens a lot, if you need a context, is the church. Hopefully not this church. But sometimes at church, you can feel that way. Because the church needs a volunteer. 
And you sign up and say, hey, I'm happy to volunteer and jump right in. And the church is like, that's great. And then you're saying, hey, I need a break. And they're saying, okay, well, let's move on to the next one. And you never hear from them again. That would be an example of people being a means to your end rather than as people. That's how David is operating, though. He is operating using somebody as property. Look at this in the passage. He looked, he noticed, he sends someone to get her. He sleeps with her. Now he's the king and he can have whatever he wants. The power and authority both affords him the opportunity to make requests. And it might be someone's life if they don't give that to him. He has the liberty and the freedom to take things and make them his to use for any purpose that he desires. But when he decided what he had wasn't enough and through his, his, his power and his freedom afforded him the chance to take something more. In our own culture, we don't need to look beyond something of a few years ago, the Me Too scandal that happened, the human trafficking, slavery that still continues to this day in our world to see that this is still taking place on big scales, on, on evil scales. Maybe not directly you, you'd say, hey, I don't do that. But it is happening in the world around us. If you're having trouble maybe relating to this, saying, well, I'm not a king and I don't use my power and that kind of stuff, consider the resources that give you power. Maybe not power in the sense of a king, but the power of the dollar and the power of attention. Someone said recently on a podcast I was listening to, they said, you know, these things that come up, whether it's on our phone or on TV or a million different places, YouTube, whatever, it's almost like we're paying them attention. We're giving them it's not, we're actually handing them money in a lot of cases, but we're, it's like we're paying them a dollar every time they come by and say, I'm giving you my attention, I'm giving you my attention. We're paying people with our attention. But the power of the dollar is far more reaching than simply what you buy and what you don't buy. It has an impact on jobs. It has an impact on what products are offered. You know, if somebody sells, you know, cabbage smelling uh, cologne and nobody buys it, well, then that's not going to be around for very long even if, it, if someone thought it was the best idea ever, right? I don't know what you think. Maybe you like the smell of cabbage, but I wouldn't buy that. Um, but the way that we spend our money obviously has power. Many of us know the more money you have access to, the more options you have. You ever met somebody that didn't have any options? And they're saying, I need this, I need this, I need this, and I have no money to get any of it. Regardless of the reasons, someone that has financial resources, though, they don't have the same problems. They might still have the same problem, but their solutions or their options to address it are a lot farther reaching, right? That's just, a, that's just the reality. And it's not always bad to have those options, but the power of the dollar is still power that many of us have not thought about in its implications. Our purchasing power can teach us a way of thinking that can start to become kind of the framework that we view other people through and even life. And it's an attitude of, what am I getting out of this? It's a mentality that seeps in from buying, from becoming consumers. If my job isn't giving me what I want, well, then I'll find a new one. If my marriage isn't delivering what I want, then I'll just find a new one. If my church isn't giving me what I want, then I'll just find a new one. And on and on, without, without even considering that people in relationships should not be interacted with the same way that we treat things or stuff. There's something deeper going on than the brand of milk you buy when you interact with people. Our dollars have power far more than we might realize. Our decisions often reach beyond the moment of purchase to live beyond and perpetuate something that we're saying. An example of this would be a lot of people will lament the loss of American jobs. They'll say all the American jobs are just leaving the country. But we continue to shop on the lowest price. Now, I'm not saying any of that's wrong. I'm just saying this is the reality of what happens. If you continually go for the cheapest price, if you peel back the layers of what's going on there, we find that the lowest price requires what? The lowest labor, the cheapest labor. And the cheapest labor often isn't found in America. And so whether you realize it or not, when you make a purchase based on the cheapest price, you are saying something whether you realize it or not. 
And so as sobering as that might be, think about the idea that products exist to fulfill a demand. And so sometimes we think, why is that even for sale? Because there's somebody that's asking for it. There's somebody that wants it. There's somebody that that needs it. So the idea that you and I can simply view something like a rated R movie or pornography and it doesn't impact anyone out in the universe other than ourselves ignores the fact that every click and every dollar that is spent there is a powerful voice that says, I want more, keep producing it. I haven't had enough. Just like King David. It says, I want more. Not to mention the disregard that it places on a daughter, on a sister, on a wife. We feel in control when we have power, and David was in control when he saw, and he noticed, and he sent for, and he slept with Bathsheba. He's in the position of power, and so he gets more. And it continues in verse 5. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Whoops. <laughs> David was all in control up to that point, at least he thought, didn't he? I mean, he was in control. He had everything in lockdown. He knew what he wanted. He sent for it. You know, everything's good. He's the king. Everything's good. But now a pregnancy has shattered that illusion that he's in control. So how will he respond? Dave says, then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go on home and relax. Verse 9, but Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, the ark And the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents. And Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How can I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? David is exerting, trying to exert his control. He's trying to cover up everything that happened that he did. If Uriah would just go home and sleep with his wife, then it's all good, right? That's what David's thinking. If If he kind of plays this role in this game, then no one would ever have to know. If only Uriah would go along with David's plan, then David would be in the clear. Nobody would be none the wiser. If only Uriah would do what David wanted him to do. If only Uriah had acted the same way as David, thinking of himself first and foremost, then David would be cleared. David wanted Uriah to be the means to his ends. Do you ever try to control the outcome? Have you ever done that in life? Have you ever thought this whole plan up and like, if this person does this and this person does this, if they'll just listen to reason and do what I want them to do, then it'll it'll all be fine. Right? Have you ever thought, if they would just do what I want them to, if they would just... Do what I ask, then I wouldn't be so angry. I, that's the that's classic parenting thing I hear, <laughs> right? I've gotten in arguments with people I love because I want them to do things I like. I'll just be honest. Maybe it's just me. But like David, I've thought, if they just do what I want, that will make this whole situation better. I thought about the way on the, on the way over to church when somebody said, I'm going to ride a bike. And I thought, why are you riding a bike? Now, that's a silly example, but it's the same situation. When we're talking about important situations here, though, more than just bike riding, the question that I think we need to wrestle with is, does it dehumanize a person when we would gladly remove their free will so that things would go better for us? The very free will that we cling to, that we champion, the very free will that leads us to take what we want because we claim it's a God-given right, does it say something about us when we want to direct someone from, for them to kind of perform in a certain way so it helps us? It makes them a player, doesn't it? It makes them just a, a part. It makes them just a means. 
So Uriah doesn't act the way that David wants him to. We, we know that from the story. Uriah actually acts opposite how David acted. He stays true to his commitments. He stays true to who he is. And not only does he take, he doesn't take advantage of situations simply because he's able. That is a horrible way to decide things. If I'm able. I mean, the power's out of your hands when you're not able. We talked about that a couple minutes ago. If you don't have, somebody said to me once, nobody here, you don't know them, you'll never know them, so don't try to think that you know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> somebody said to me once, they're like, I really want to get this new car. And I said, oh, okay, and, there's, and I'm saying, so what's stopping you? Like, I'm just curious. And they said, well, I don't know if I can. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, I don't know if I have enough money. I said, oh, okay. I can understand that. I've, said, I've thought that about things. I really want that, but I don't have the money for it. There's other people, though, that would say, I'm going to buy that car. And say, why? Well, because I can, because I have the money. Now, obviously, money is an important part in that role. But if that's the only way that we're deciding things, if that's the only way we come to the decision of whether or not we should do something, then we're allowing money to be what directs our steps. And so whether or not we can do something is, I think, just a horrible way to decide everything. Now, you want to buy a sucker next to the counter? Maybe that's an easy decision. <laughs> but David did this because he could. And he didn't stop to think whether or not he should. And that's a big difference. Verse 12. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah. He couldn't get Uriah. He couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. New trick by David. Same result. Uriah is the antithesis of this new David. He's the opposite of it. And David continues to try and manipulate people so he can cover up the situation. Oops, I'm not moving there, Jamie. There we go. Verse 14 says, The next morning David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. At this point, we realize, if we didn't realize it already, that David has jumped the shark. And not just in some pretty meaningless way, like, you know, he never ate chocolate for the first 20 years of, the, of his life because he didn't want to go, to go to his hips, and now he's saying, oh, well, forget it, I'm going to eat chocolate. It's not something like that, right? This is, a, this is very meaningful, impactful things that are happening. The venue of entertainment is pretty meaningless. But with the life, the life of Uriah, the life of Bathsheba, and his own life and calling as king, he is messing with those things. He has jumped the shark in those things. For the better part, for of a book and a half, we've come to know David as someone that is humble, someone that, is, that fights and defends enemies, and defeats enemies of God's and defends the weak, including giants. He's a David who waits upon God's plan. How long did he wait to become king after becoming anointed? He seeks out the presence of God. He answers God's call. He has integrity. He does the right thing every time for basically a book and a half. He's a David that delights in the Lord and is a man after his own heart. But we don't see that here. David's jumped the shark. We see a David that moves without consulting God, a David that answers his desires rather than answers to God, a David that asserts and uses his power and authority, a David who defines the right thing to do by what will work best first and foremost for himself instead of what's the right thing to do, what's God calling me to do, or any of that. And so how could this possibly speak to us today? Last I, unless you have some royal blood that I don't know about, I don't think any of us are kings or queens in this room. Even if someone might say, yes, queen, that's not what they mean, right? 
But I think of Paul's words in Galatians. Galatians 3.15. And here's what he said. For you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. If we took the story of David and we held up this passage, what did he use his freedom for? His desires are to serve in love. We all love freedom and autonomy, but we would do well to remember and understand that the liberty and freedom that we have does not give us license to do whatever simply because we want to. Without having the potential to damage relationships, not only with one another, but our relationship with God as well. Because God says this is the way to live, this is the way to behave, this is the way to live as people of God. And when we we have the freedom to choose not to do that, we need to recognize that that choice will pick a side each and every time. Jesus came to free us, but he also came to transform us, to make us new, giving us a new mind, the mind of Christ, making us more and more like him each and every day. It's a freedom to live motivated by the love of Jesus Christ. And that shows up in our decisions. Sometimes we think, hey, you know what? I showed up and I came to church, so that's my decision, so I'm good for the week. All my other decisions are mine. I gave that one to God. Well, I'd say, I appreciate you coming to church. But what God wants is a daily walk with you where every decision is put under His leadership and His authority, and you can either go your way or His way. And you have the freedom to choose. And you can control the choices that you make. But you can't control the consequences. You just can't. I think we see that in David's life. We could stand up and probably share all around the room the times that we thought we had everything figured out. We made a choice maybe that we knew in the moment wasn't right, or maybe we look back on and say we made the wrong choice. We recognize, man, I didn't know what the consequences were going to be from that. And if we could only do it all over again, the good thing is we don't have to live in the past. And so if there's consequences to choices that we've made in the past, we have a God that will meet us where we are that says, come to me and we can make this right going forward. You can be made right going forward. We can't deal, we can't change the past, but you can be forgiven. You can be made new. You can be redeemed. You can be justified. You can be adopted as a son or a daughter of the Most High God. And you can live out the purpose that He has for you from this point forward. There's a line that I've said, and I borrowed it from somebody, and it's probably been said for hundreds of years, but you're never too far gone to take the first right step towards God. It's not like God had one plan for your life. I mean, people get stressed out about this. Some people do. They'll say, man, God had this plan for my life, and I messed it all up. I got married to someone I was never supposed to marry. I had kids I was never supposed to have. You know what? (laughs) I don't think God works that way. I don't think he'd say, yep, you're right. Make sure you get rid of all of them and come over here and, and start new. That's not what God's saying. What's done is done. But the future doesn't have to look like the past. And the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is that every day to starting right now doesn't have to look like what's been our story up to this point. And some of us, we see our parents, we see family, we see friends, and they're caught in the same thing. And we're saying, that's just going to be my life forever. But that's not true with Jesus Christ. The reality of it is, is you might just be in a chapter of the story, not the whole story. <coughs> Excuse me. (coughs) But Jesus offers to turn the page to a new story. Paul Harvey used to say it's the rest of the story. And it doesn't have to read like the first five chapters, the first ten chapters, the first 300 chapters. It could be a new day moving forward in Jesus Jesus Christ. 
we still have decisions to make that sometimes are very, seem very small. But the small decisions can impact the big decisions because they create a way of thinking. Big and complex decisions happen too and pretty much everything in between. But the question we will always have to answer is, will we jump the shark? Or will we stay true to who we say we are following and what we want to become? Maybe even as we are learning to be like Christ. We're not always going to do it perfectly. But by His grace, He can lead us to do it better. Who are our decisions impact besides ourselves? Who are our decisions ultimately hurt? Maybe relationally, maybe physically, maybe whatever. Are we going to simply take and use just because we can like David, or are we going to see people as more than a means to our end? If you're a Christian, then I invite you to follow Christ. Moving beyond to simply believing, but decide what to do because the love of Christ calls us and compels us not to treat people like stuff, but to treat people made in the image of God like they are worthy of love, even if they're not being lovable. That we won't just discard people or try to control people, that we won't operate from a position of power, but we will live motivated from a position of love. People don't exist simply for you. People exist to be united with the presence of God, filled with and blessed with His transforming grace and love, and in turn, sharing that blessing with others. So when you meet somebody and they're taking your money for gas, serving you lunch or dinner, checking out your groceries, they are more than what they are doing. And how you treat them will tell them that in one way or another. People were made to be loved by God filled with God, joined with God, and sometimes we may be the only ones that are sharing that with them. So let's remember that. As we make decisions in how we live with people, how we interact with people, and everything else, Lord, God will help us. I believe that.